What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 171. Today, we are talking about a wild series of bank robberies and hostage situations, heists that happened in several different states here in the United States. And not that many people know about this one. I feel like it wasn't that well reported on. Not nationally, but mm-hmm. it's it's a really wild story. In it fact, it, it really draws comparisons to uh, Evil Genius. If you yeah. ever saw that episode that we did, there's a lot of similarities with that. Also known as the pizza bomber bomber i mm. almost said robber pizza yeah. robber <laughs> the pizza bomber case so it's, that case yes, pizza is bomber fucking crazy that is that so if you one, thought that was crazy this is almost yeah. as crazy as that one yeah so i thought it was interesting too because i actually i feel like i always say this i used to do this i used to do that <laughs> i was actually a, a bank teller for about six months so i thought it'd be interesting because i do have some insight into how banks work i you know i used to count the vault i used to do all these things <laughs> You know have meetings about what happens if a, a robbery takes place mm-hmm. things like that so because you were like out in the wild west pretty much i was you just never know who might walk <laughs> he in was through in, the door working in eaton colorado tiny tiny, tiny little farming town i mean yeah the, the chances of a robbery happening there <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably zero there wasn't much enough. action for josh in those six months no it was like all retirees <laughs> that was like a weird out. phase when you got that job that was so random because he was in tech for so long and then i was in tech and kind of in between jobs with tech so i needed something to do mm-hmm. so i just like I was like, oh, I okay. guess I could do work at a bank. I yeah. tried to work for Wells Fargo, but they they denied me for some reason. What would you rate the job out of ten, <laughs> out of as far as being interesting or? Um, I mean, it's not that bad. It's pretty easy to be honest. Like, it's as long as you're good at counting, because you're counting money all day and mm, dealing with cash. I would uh, suck at that. People <laughs> would bring in just like giant bags of cash and just drop it on the counter like or change in Eaton. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would probably only be like a couple hundred bucks worth of like coins and dollars. Mm -hmm. But But the problem was, is that like our little branch, I mean, I worked for like a community bank, so we didn't have all this fancy like money counters and things like that. So I had to do it all by hand. Damn. So I would like our coin machine never worked because normally you could just dump all the coins in the coin machine. It counts it up and like packages it up for, you know, the people to come pick it up. But I would have to count it out by hand. So mm-hmm. I got a lot of experience counting bills and all that kind of stuff. It's a <laughs> it's a pretty like good job though. It's it's you know, I mean, as long as you don't get robbed and have to experience that, because a lot of people do deal with robbery, yeah. especially in in uh, more, you know, city areas, mm-hmm. things like that, where there's more of that kind of stuff going on. Yeah, imagine something like this happen to you. Yeah, yeah. This one just takes everything to the next level because these bank robbers, man, they they were truly professionals. You know, not just your average person that's just like running in and be like, give me all your money. This is this is much more intricate than that. So I'm very excited to get into this one. Yeah, it's really interesting. We've got a lot to cover with this story today because like Kendall said, it takes place in multiple states. The mm-hmm. FBI is involved. So there is a lot of information to cover, but I promise you this is a wild, wild ride. So before we get into things, this episode is brought to you by Stitch Fix, Third Love, Upstart, Native, and Raycon. Thank but, you to our sponsors. Yes, thank you. Is there anything else we should add before we begin? Hmm. I don't know. Do I have anything to oh, add? Oh, Planet Sleep. Oh, yeah. You have something to add. Yes. Planet Sleep is now live. Episode one, the Amazon Rainforest. Thank you to everybody who's already checked it out, listened to it, gave me feedback. Really appreciate it. It's been really cool seeing the people who fell asleep to it at night and then they came back the next morning to leave feedback and said they got a good night's sleep. Oh, that was so Or they cool. were able yeah. to fall asleep. Mission accomplished. Yeah, mission accomplished. Yeah, some people were like, yeah, I was asleep in like 10 minutes and it's an hour long episode. So <laughs> it gives you, you know, you can start yeah. 10 minutes and then the next 10 minutes the next night. And then, yeah, one episode should last you about a week. And you can learn a lot in these episodes. It's not just describing nature and talking you know, in a relaxing way, there's actually a lot of educational content in there. Yeah. And I really wanted to take this opportunity to not only just educate you about nature and in general, but to also talk about the indigenous peoples Mm -hmm. as well as uh, issues related to climate and to deforestation and habitats being destroyed and all that. Because I think it's really important to kind of keep that in the front of people's minds that this is really happening and and oh. I think, sorry, I was just going to say, I don't think a lot of people do that in podcasts. Like you're mm. one of the first to I think, kind of like mix between entertainment, but also trying to like continue to bring awareness into the podcast space. Because mm-hmm. I know there's like news podcasts and science, like, of course, there's science podcasts and stuff. But right. I just think it's like for this like entertainment, like soothing meditation mm-hmm. factor, bringing that into the mix as well is really cool. Really unique. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I thought, too. I thought it's important to, you know, not just give people 
candy, but also make people really think about things. You know, when you're thinking deeply and listening and you're, you're going off to sleep, but you're also thinking about, you know, what's actually going on in, you know, the rainforest is being destroyed at an alarming rate. Indigenous peoples are dying. I mean, mm-hmm. tribes that are, have been living there since the dawn of time are being wiped off the face of the planet all due to log- logging and all sorts of other issues, fires mm-hmm. and just deforestation in general. So, and all these animals, these beautiful animals that you only find in the rainforest are disappearing at an alarming rate because their habitats are being destroyed. And we could get to a point in even our lifetimes where that doesn't exist anymore. We're literally showing our kids pictures of animals that were alive when we were kids. Yeah, it's a very real possibility. Are no longer there. Oh, it's already happening. Yeah. yeah. But I tried to put it all together so it's not like, it's not overwhelming overwhelming or depressing or anything mm-hmm. like that. It's more of just to feed your subconscious and really kind of plant those seeds for people to really mm-hmm. kind of be like, oh, that's good to know. I didn't realize that that yeah. was happening or, you know, especially indigenous peoples. I think it's important that we you know, do everything, everything we can to protect them and protect their history and culture because yeah, I mean, a planet without all these cultures is, is a very boring and bland planet really. So that's what I'm trying to do with planet sleep is just kind of like bring awareness. Yeah. To all those I think you're and, doing an amazing job of that. It's so well written and I learned so much just from the first episode. So I think you guys will really enjoy it. Be sure to check that out. If you want help going to sleep. Yes. A new episodes go up every single Monday, and that is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. And we also have a beautiful visual form of the show that you can throw on your TV at night on YouTube as well. So we'll put all the links below. So let's get into our case. We're starting so, off in Connecticut. Yeah. So the story this story takes a lot of different turns. It, the really it starts in Connecticut. That's really where you know the reporting really first started with with this whole case in general. So we're going to start with a man named Matthew Yusman. So on Sunday evenings, 46-year-old Matthew Yesman always went out with his friends to play in a hockey league. He was actually the goalie for the Trash Pandas. Matt loved playing hockey, and he never missed a game. One Sunday in February 2015, he got home late around midnight after celebrating a joyous victory with his teammates. His 70-year-old mother, Valerie, had actually moved into his home in Bristol, Connecticut after his father died. And that night, she was up late watching the Academy Awards. The show had ended just as she heard the garage door open and Matt pull in. While he was unloading his hockey equipment, he saw a man running up the driveway toward him. And this man was aiming a gun at him and yelling for him to get on the ground, pretending they were the police. And Matt did just as he was told and got down on his knees. It only took a split second for Matt to realize that this guy was not the police and... He still complied, though. He got down on his knees, and that's when he felt the barrel of the gun pressed against the back of his head as the man told him to lie face down on the ground. His hands were then secured behind his back with zip ties. As he looked up, he saw a second man coming up the driveway. Both men were wearing ski goggles and heavy clothing, and Matt couldn't see any distinguishing characteristics. All he could see was their build. One man was tall and thin, and the other was shorter and more stout. Just then, Valerie appeared in the doorway, as she had come out to check on, you know, why Matt hadn't come inside already. She was then immediately ordered to kneel on the ground next to Matt, and she begged the men not to hurt them. The garage door was wide open, but neighbors wouldn't be able to see any of this happening, as they lived on a cul-de-sac, and the ranch house sat far back away from the road. The men then led Matt and Valerie into the house. Matt was led to a couch in the living room and forced to take a seat. One of the men put a knit hat over his face and wrapped it in duct tape to make sure he couldn't see. Then he put headphones over his ears that were playing a loud static. At this point, Matt was completely disoriented, and there was no way to get free from the zip ties around his wrists. And now he couldn't see or hear anything either. The other man led Valerie to her bedroom and told her to lie down on the bed. He turned on the TV and put the volume all the way up, and she just did as she was told completely terrified. As Matt tried to figure out what these men wanted, the static in his ears cut out, and that's when he heard an electronic and creepy voice. The voice said that they were going to rob him, and he was going to be the one committing the robbery. Basically, these guys used a voice-changing device in order to relay the messages to him to likely 
tried to mask their actual voices. But the kidnappers said that they owed a lot of money to some very bad people. And Matt was going to get it for them. Because Matt Yusman was the chief financial officer at a local credit union. And the plan was for him to go to work as usual the next morning, get $4.2 million in cash from the vault, and bring it to an address that would be texted to him at 10 a.m. And they were going to text him from his mother's phone. Matt was like, my branch doesn't carry that kind of cash. But he said that he could get them at least $1 million. At 3 a.m. in the morning, one of the men went into the bedroom. And he used nearly an entire roll of heavy-duty duct tape, basically gorilla tape, to secure her feet to the footboard of the bed. That'd be so painful. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Gorilla tape, that tape is sticky. Like just eventually when you have to take it off. Mm -hmm. It's going to rip yeah. basically hair and skin off of you. Yeah. And the man warned her not to go anywhere while they were gone. She was so terrified, she said she wouldn't move a muscle. They then told Matt that they were taking him for a ride, which that's never, you know, that's never a good thing to hear it's from terrifying. abductors. I don't even know what would be going through my mind in a situation like this. Yeah, because I so mean. So many things. Right. I mean, you're like, what are they going to do? Take me out to the woods and shoot me or something? Yeah. Like, what's, is this it? So he was put in the back seat of his own SUV and one of the men had put a pillow back there from his house for Matt to put his face into, which my gathering is that this was to make sure that he didn't like start screaming when mm -hmm. they were driving him around yeah. potentially i mean who knows but they drove for about 15 minutes before stopping and one of the men got out and walked away matt heard footsteps on gravel or snow he then heard another car start and the man got back in the suv and they started driving again and the next thing he knew they were bringing him back into his house again they sat him back on the couch and asked him if he wanted to take a shower, which Matt was like, what? You take a shower? <laughs> so like, that's just such a weird thing for, mm -hmm. you know, home invaders to say to somebody. But Matt was like, okay, I guess so. After his late night shower, he was then led to the kitchen. And the kidnappers had laid out several items on the table and told him that there was one more step to their plan. To make sure that Matt got the money that they wanted. They plan to strap an explosive device to his body that could then be detonated remotely from a cell phone. As an added insurance policy, it would explode automatically the next morning at 11 a.m. And that would give Matt one hour from the time they text him to get the money to the location they wanted. They told him that the device was made of C4, an explosive that can be molded like clay. And they used the materials on the table to make the device and secured it to Matt's waist with duct tape. And just before sunrise, one of the men went into Valerie's room and she heard what was going on and was crying. And the man told her, don't be alarmed and asked where she kept her vacuum. She told him where to find it and then listened as he brought it out to their living room and vacuumed. He then came back and vacuumed up her bedroom. So they're clearly trying to remove their evidence from the crime scene. Their I guess DNA. that's what they think they're doing. I guess it's to make sure there's no hair follicles and scraps of skin. On well, the good ground. luck with just a vacuum, yeah, bro. I know, right? That's just so weird. Just before 8.30, they told Matt it was time to go to work. To make sure he didn't do anything stupid like call the police or try to escape, they told him that they left another explosive device under his mother's bed. And if anything went wrong, they would detonate it. So he was terrified. They reminded him that they would text him the location to drop the money at exactly 10 a.m. and that the C4 would automatically explode at 11. So he better be there on time and be ready to complete his mission. They pulled the knit hat from his head and cut the zip ties and then put him in his car. At 8.30, he was alone in his car driving to the branch office in New Britain, Connecticut. He checked his rearview window, expecting to see the kidnappers following him, but they weren't. He assumed the only reason that they would trust him to be alone was because they weren't bluffing about the explosives on his waist and under his mom's bed. On the drive, he called a co-worker and told him to immediately evacuate the branch. He explained that he and his mother had been victims of a home invasion the night before. He was on his way into work to empty the vault and had an explosive strapped to his waist. Matt warned him to not call the police or he and his mother would both be killed. 
And the last thing he said was, this is my life. Don't play with it. Don't call the police. When he arrived at the credit union, it looked empty. He felt relief as he turned the corner. But as soon as he could see the front of the building, his heart sank. Police cars were already pulling in. He looked at the clock. He had two hours and 15 minutes to get to the drop site. The coworker he called was out of town. And after hanging up, he immediately called 911, explaining that one of his VPs was driving to the branch with a bomb strapped to him. Here's the 911 call. So now all it's this emergency. I just received a call from one of our VPs stating that he and his mom is a victim right now of a home invasion. He states he has a bomb. He's sitting in his car that the perpetrators also put a bomb under the mother's bed. And he's instructing me to vacate our new Britain branch because they're going to come and rob it. So Sergeant David Makarski and his partner were two of the first officers on the scene. He knew the make, model, color, and license plate of Matt's car. When he pulled in, he rolled down his window, and the officers immediately called for him to get out of the car. Matt opened his car door slowly and stepped out. And for 15 seconds, they all just stood still, staring at each other. David's partner drew his gun and pointed it at Matt, ordering him to show him the device. So Matt lifted up his shirt carefully, and to them, the device looked real. Since it was freezing that morning, just 9 degrees Fahrenheit, They told Matt to get back in his car and just wait. David, his partner, and the other officers made sure that they stayed at least 100 feet away from the car. The chief of police had been briefed on the case and immediately got to work. He and his top command staff shut down the surrounding streets and the interstate. They evacuated all the buildings in the area and put all the schools on lockdown. The SWAT team and the state's bomb squad were called in, and they had to travel to New Britain from all over Connecticut. David Makarski was a member of the crisis negotiation team, and he became the main point of contact with Matt, communicating by cell phone. Matt told him about his mother. He was still very concerned about her, and David assured him that he had officers on the way to help her. He told him to just stay calm, and the bomb squad is on their way. But staying calm was nearly impossible, as you can imagine. Matt started thinking about the pizza bomber case in Pennsylvania. Brian Wells was killed when the collar bomb around his neck actually exploded. Matt started to think he might be killed too. In interviews, he talks about how weird it was to think about this actually happening to him and how he was trying to figure out if he would see anything when it happened. Would he see smoke? Would he hear it? Would he feel anything? Think of the thoughts that would be going through your head if you had this thing strapped to you. Probably the exact same ones. Yeah. Is it going to be quick and easy for me? Is it going to be painful? (sighs) Is it going to scare people? Like so many thoughts would be running through your head. Meanwhile, nine miles away, Valerie was trapped in her bed. Once she was sure the kidnappers were gone, she started working to free herself. But they had used so much duct tape that it took a very long time for her to get it all off. Oh, I'm sure it was so painful. What was interesting, though, is that they only duct taped her feet. They did not duct tape her hands. So she had her hands to help, you know, allow herself mm-hmm. to start unwrapping the duct tape. Once she was freed, she looked out the window and saw police officers arriving. She hurried to the door to greet them, but as soon as she opened it, she saw a rifle pointed right at her. An officer yelled for her to walk into the driveway and lift up her shirt. They thought she might have a bomb strapped to her just like Matt did, and she did just as she was told. And when they confirmed there was no bomb, they put her into a police car and took her to the station. Back at the bank, David told Matt that his mother was okay. He was relieved, but obviously still scared to death. The waiting was becoming unbearable, and he started to cry. Right at 10 a.m., the kidnappers texted him from his mother's phone, and the message said, Are you done yet? The bomb squad hadn't arrived yet, and David told Matt to buy some time and say he's still getting the money. Matt told them that it was taking longer because there was more money than he had expected. (laughs) That's actually really smart. Yeah, it is. And they were like, okay, great. Keep going. At 1024, they texted again, and it was the address of the drop site, a nearby cemetery. They told him to leave the money at the flagpole. The police were actually able to trace the text to the area around the cemetery and try to catch them. But by the time they arrived, the kidnappers had fled, likely just a few minutes before. Matt anxiously watched the phone as the minutes ticked by, and there were no more texts from the kidnappers. At 1050, the bomb squad still wasn't there and David kept reassuring him that everything would be okay. But finally, they arrived, and the team was led by Mike Avery, 
and this was his first time dealing with a device actually strapped to a person. Mike didn't know if Matt was a suspect or a victim, so he had to prepare for any scenario. He decided to send a robot with a camera out to get a better idea of what they were dealing with, but the robot couldn't get a good enough shot of the device. Meanwhile, four sniper teams were moving into position around the bank because they were worried that if Matt, you know, if he was the suspect and he tried to run towards law enforcement, that, you know, they have to take him out before yeah. he can hurt anybody else. At two minutes to 11, Matt was certain he was going to die. He sat perfectly still watching the seconds tick by. And when the clock struck 11, he held his breath and sat perfectly still. That is truly terrifying. Couldn't even imagine. And then nothing happened. There was a collective sigh of relief and the bomb squad continued their work. At 11.10, he was told to get out of his vehicle. Mike and his partner drove up alongside him in an armored vehicle to inspect the device. The C4 was completely wrapped around his body with a ridiculous amount of duct tape. The only way to get it off was for a person to actually pull all of the duct tape off and then disconnect the device. So Mike volunteered. He put on an armored suit to prepare. Matt was told to then get on his knees in the parking lot, but he had no coat on and he was freezing cold. He was shaking, but he had to use a portable x-ray machine to take an image of the device and make a plan for how to disable it. From the image, there was no way to tell if it was really C4 or just molding clay, but he had to treat it like it was C4 and highly dangerous. Mike told Matt that he was going to get it off of him. So he started using cutting tools and he had to slowly cut and pull back the duct tape, which went all the way up his back. And this guy was pretty damn hairy. So you can imagine how bad that hurt. He did his best to remain perfectly still so Mike could work on getting off the bomb, but it was so painful. Just before removing the device, Mike said that it's going to drop to the ground once he cuts it off. And he told him that as soon as it does, to run as fast as you can. Matt remembered Mike telling him to kick the device, and when he did, it got stuck on his shoe like a piece of toilet paper. Mike called out, it's on your shoe. And in Matt's memory, this was a moment of humor in a tense situation. But it turns out that Mike said none of that actually happened. He thinks that Matt kind of made up this slapstick moment to help him process the trauma of such a terrifying experience. Once he was sure that he was safe, Matt walked up to a SWAT team member to thank him. He was immediately handcuffed and put into an ambulance. He was told that this was for his own safety and was taken to the hospital to get checked out. As it turns out, the device that was strapped to Matt's body was made out of ordinary molding clay, not C4. There were random wires connected to nothing, and there was no timer on it. Here's some footage of the device if you're watching on YouTube. Also, no surprise, but there was no explosive device under Valerie's bed either. The kidnappers had been bluffing the whole time. Unfortunately, this made their story seem a lot more unbelievable. Detectives were suspicious that maybe Matt and Valerie were not telling the truth. And of course, they have to think about this. They don't have much other evidence. And since there was no bomb actually placed on him, you got to wonder if he may have set all of this up by himself. But why? I mean, yeah. he didn't even make it into the bank. But... In an interview with CBS, the police chief implied that Matt had called his coworker to help him rob the bank. The alleged kidnappers did a lot of things that they couldn't explain. They secured Valerie to her bed by her feet, but left her hands free. She claimed that they were sweet and gentle, being careful not to hurt her. And after the man finished securing her feet, he hugged her and told her not to worry. He even brought her cookies and a soda. They thought this was a little sus. And no one could figure out why these kidnappers had asked for a vacuum cleaner and swept the floors or why they had Matt take a late night shower. Which on second thought, it actually makes complete sense. The vacuum was to mm -hmm. clean up any evidence off the floor and have Matt take a shower so that there's no DNA from them mm -hmm. from when they you know, were dealing with them earlier. That's what they have tried wash to off. do. Yeah, I think in theory, the they thought that would behind work. It, yeah. Right. Matt couldn't explain the drive that they had taken him on before the shower or why they had used an electronic voice to speak to him. The police chief was briefed on the interviews with Valerie and Matt, but decided that they couldn't rule anything out here. They could be victims, but they could also be suspects. The mood in the interview room changed dramatically. Now they were being interrogated. It was clear that the officers did not believe their story about the kidnappers. Earlier that day, the police had contacted Matt's brother and nephew to learn more about him. And they both said that he had a gambling problem and owed a lot of money. That's really unfortunate, too. You know, know. you're in this 
situation where you're clearly the victim and then the police are sus of you and then they call your family and you're hoping to get a good you know that they'll help clear mm -hmm. your name but instead they give them more information that just creates more doubt in their minds i mean that's super unfortunate but i also understand like i don't think it is so clear like you said because if i was in the police situation i would consider that they could have set something like this up too i mean people do things like this absolutely yeah so they confronted Matt with this information and he denied it. He said that he does like to gamble, but he's not in debt. They tried to get Matt to admit that he was somehow involved with the planning of the robbery. Maybe the kidnappers disguised their voices and wore masks because Matt knew them. Maybe he owed someone money and this is how they planned to get it back. Matt continued to deny any involvement, however, but the officers seemed convinced that he was lying. They took samples of Matt's DNA and asked him to take a polygraph test. He agreed and took the polygraph test, but he failed part of it. The test indicated that he was lying when asked if he had any involvement in the scheme. And that was like the straw that broke the camel's back for the uh, mm -hmm. law enforcement because they literally told him before, if you fail this, this is going to basically force us to charge you with, with this crime. But they really can't. I mean. Well, I think it's enough. It's enough for them suspicion for them to really direction. like continue to pursue him as a suspect. They yeah. really, I mean, they do use polygraphs all the time to try to figure out if somebody's lying about their story or not. Yeah. And just not, sometimes they can be very questionable. They are, but for whatever reason, law enforcement still uses them like they are 100% yeah. effective. But see, in this case, he's telling the truth, but he's pegged as a liar because of a polygraph. So the forensic team searched their car and house for any trace of the kidnappers and found nothing. Seems like they did a pretty good job cleaning up after all. There was no physical evidence to corroborate Matt's story. The police chief held a press conference because the community was on edge after the streets and the interstate were shut down for half a day. He explained that they weren't sure yet if Matthew Yusman had, you know, been coerced or if he had been the mastermind behind the entire crime all along. Over the next few days, the police executed search warrants for Matt's house, computers, and phone, and they subpoenaed all his bank records. He was put on leave from his job while the credit union conducted their own investigation as well. He knew he was in trouble, so he hired a lawyer. I would have too. Yeah. I mean, that's not good. Mm -mm. Everything's kind of like stacking up against you and mm -hmm. nobody's believing your, you know, the truth. Yeah. That's a really, that's really scary. bad position to be in. It is. But at this point, there was no one in custody. They had no credible leads. So the guys got away with it and they took their little scheme to Tennessee next. But we will get to that when we get back from our ad break. Today's episode is brought to you by Third Love, which is one of our favorite sponsors. They've been a big supporter of the show for years now, and we truly love their products. For at least the past two years, I have refused to wear any other bra but a Third Love bra because they're so comfortable. And they don't just make bras. Third Love also creates high quality and very comfortable underwear, sleepwear, and loungewear. With cup sizes from double A through I, including half cups, and loungewear and sleepwear in sizes extra small to 3X. If you need more support, Third Love's number one best selling 24 7 classic t shirt bra provides all the comfort and support you need, and it comes in more than 80 sizes. They have an amazing fitting room quiz if you're confused about what size you are. The fitting room quiz is like a personal shopper, but better. It's interactive and focuses on size, breast shape, current fit issues, and your personal style to deliver bras and underwear that are perfect for you. Third Love also gives back. They're the largest donor of undergarments in the United States. They partner with organizations in their local San Francisco Bay Area and across the United States. And Third Love has donated over $40 million in product to help women make powerful life changes. And they've even helped heal injured turtles. Third Love knows that you deserve to feel comfortable and confident 24-7. So right now they are offering our listeners 20% off your first order. All you got to do is go to thirdlove.com slash mile higher right now to find your perfect fitting bra and get 20% off your first purchase. That's thirdlove.com slash mile higher for 20% off today. I don't know about you guys, but life has started to feel more normal again. I'm so happy that my gym has reopened and I'm able to go in and just, you know, pump some iron, just totally get out of my normal work day and completely de-stress while I sort of pump myself back up. But no matter how you're feeling about getting back out there, there's no denying it's an adjustment, right? When the world gets too loud, something I love to do is create my own soundtrack by popping in my Raycon wireless earbuds. 
Sometimes you need some upbeat music to pump you up before you see people or stay calm with some guided meditation. I use my everyday earbuds from Raycon all the time. Whether it's falling asleep at night, I like to listen to motivational speeches. I like to listen to spiritual speeches. I like to listen to all sorts of different things at night to fall asleep. And then I obviously use them at the gym all the time to help me get through my workouts. And I got to say, the, I'm so impressed with these earbuds and just the quality of the sound and the fit is unmatched, honestly. Raycons are truly the best way to listen to any sort of music or sound. They come with a bunch of gel tips for your comfort. Unlike some other brands, they don't stick out of your ears. That's like my favorite thing about them is that other earbuds I've used, they literally hurt my ears, especially when laying down in bed. But Raycons, they fit so perfectly in your ear, you basically don't even know that they're there. I fall asleep with them in all the time. I also love that Raycons have a 32 hour battery life so you can listen to what you want when you want for a really long time. And they start at half the price of the other premium audio brands, but they sound just as good. And I can 100% attest to that. That is very much a true fact. And with Raycons, they come with a 45 day happiness guarantee. So you really can't lose. Give them a try and you'll see what I'm talking about. Create your own soundtrack with Raycon right now. Mile Hire listeners get 15% off their Raycon order at buyraycon.com slash milehire. That's buyraycon.com slash milehire to save 15% on Raycons. Buyraycon.com slash milehire and seriously, check it out today. You won't be disappointed. Nobody likes to have bad BO and I know sometimes for me, especially after a workout, I can definitely be stinking pretty bad, but you don't have to because you can try Native. Native cares about the products you put on your body. They're about stopping the stink right away. That's the native difference. You probably already know about native's legendary aluminum free deodorant, but have you tried their body wash, their amazing toothpaste, or their brand new mineral based sunscreen? So important to take care of your skin. Yes, native now has broad spectrum SPF 30 sunscreen for your face and body. It's lightweight and absorbs quickly and you can choose between unscented or coconut and pineapple. Native's on a mission to overhaul your entire hygiene routine by putting the care in self-care with products carefully made to work against odor that are made with simple ingredients and smell great. You can get their deodorant and body wash and amazing scents like coconut and vanilla, citrus and herbal musk, lavender and rose, and more. You can even build your own personalized product bundles, mix and match three of your favorite scents, and keep them on rotation so you always have something for every occasion. I absolutely love all of Native's products, I think. What I like best is just the way that they smell. They don't smell chemically and nasty. They smell very fresh and natural. And obviously I love that the deodorant doesn't have aluminum in it because you don't want to be putting that stuff in your body. So you can get that protection that you need from sweat, but also take care of your body at the same time. So stay fresh, stay clean with Native by going to nativedo.com slash milehire20 or use promo code milehire20 at checkout and get 20% off your first order. That's Native D-E-O dot com slash milehire20 or use promo code milehire20 at checkout for 20% off your first order. Two months later on April 28th, 2015, a man named Mark Ziegler was heading out the door to go to work. He was the CEO of a credit union in a suburb of Knoxville, Tennessee. And as he pulled out of his driveway, he noticed that the trash can had been knocked over. So he stopped his car to get out and pick it up. And at that very moment, Two men masked with guns surrounded him. The first guy was white, tall, and slender with a sunburst tattoo on his neck. The second was black with a stockier build. He was wearing sunglasses and a bandana, and Mark could see his bald head. The men then forced him back into his house where his wife and teenage son were still inside. All three of them were handcuffed, and Mark was shown a detailed three-page note of their plan. He was going to get $3.4 million from the vault of his credit union and any gold bars or coins inside. He would have 45 minutes to get the cash and gold and bring it back to them. And for every minute he went over, his wife would lose a finger. That's terrifying. Yeah, that is. I would probably go rob my own my own credit union too. I know. Like thinking about being in these positions. I mean, so many of us would do what we you have would comply. to do. You comply. I mean, I don't want to yeah. see you lose fingers. Oh, no. To know no. that you'd be getting your fingers chopped so would be scary. Terrible. That's just horrible to have to think of something happening to your spouse, you know, that you are going to ultimately be the deciding factor in whether or not it happens. That's just, oh, so much stress and anxiety. Right. And then just the fear of like, I have to go rob my yeah. own bank. Like, oh, my 
God. Am I going to go to prison for this? Like, so, so scary. You know, that's what would be crossing my mind. Like, God. Mm, will I get shot outside? Yeah, or, exactly. Or yeah. Am I going to get shot by the police? Like, who knows what could happen? Mm -hmm. They also claim they had men watching their adult daughter who lived in Texas. And if they ran out of fingers, these men would kidnap her, chop up her body, and then mail it to them. While the black male watched the family, the white male went outside. A few minutes later, a white woman came in and she said she needed milk for the baby. By this point, Mark's head was spinning. He was so confused and absolutely terrified. The kidnappers took off his handcuffs, gave him a black bag, and told him to go to work. They called him on a cell phone and told him to keep it in his pocket so they could listen. And Mark did exactly as he was told. He arrived at the bank and went straight to the vault and loaded it up with $200,000 in cash. On his way out, he slipped a note to an employee that said, Home Invasion call the police. The employee called 911 immediately after Mark left the bank. On his way out of the parking lot, he was stopped by a police car. The kidnappers were listening through his cell phone in his pocket. So he said, hey, the police are here. They're approaching me. What do you want me to do? And one of the men on the other line said, abort, abort. <laughs> and then he hung up. So stupid. I know. It's like, God, not even getting out of the parking lot. They're, they knew it was like, mm -hmm. it was over. Back at the house, the kidnappers blindfolded Mark's wife and son and loaded them into the family's SUV. They drove them to a parking lot, got out of the SUV, and drove off in a different vehicle, leaving the victims behind. They managed to get out and call for help, but the kidnappers, by this point, were long gone. The family members were able to give detailed descriptions of the suspects. The police made composite sketches and distributed them through the media. The girl kind of looks like Cher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they on, honestly, they all look like some disguises. <laughs> like, they don't even look like real people, but that's what they said they looked like. Mm -hmm. Forensic teams searched the house and vehicles, and there was no trace of the kidnappers. That morning, Assistant U.S. Attorney David Lewin was vacationing at Great Smoky Mountains National Park when he received an urgent message. The message said that as soon as he had cell reception to contact the FBI, he was brought in to help lead investigator Mick Nocera with the Ziegler case. But at this point, no one had made the connection between this bizarre attempted robbery and what happened to Matt Yusman in Connecticut two months earlier. When Matt Yusman read about the case in Tennessee, he tried to tell investigators the crimes were linked, but they dismissed it as just a coincidence. He was allegedly attacked by two white males and it wasn't the same guy, so they must be copycats. Matt was allowed to return to work, but he was still under investigation by the FBI and he was told they were pretty sure he was still guilty. So then the kidnappers decided to target another family in Tennessee. This time it was the Harris family, Tanner and Abigail Harris, a young couple who lived in the Knoxville area with their five month old son. It hadn't been that long since the Ziegler family was attacked, but Tanner and Abigail had never heard about it because they were too focused on their new born baby to pay close attention to the news. One morning, Abigail decided to head out for a quick jog and she left the baby upstairs with Tanner. She was in a good mood and smiling when she went down the steps and into the garage to head out. As soon as she opened the door, she saw two masked men with guns. So she slammed the door and ran back upstairs as fast as she could, screaming. But the men in the garage had a crowbar, so they pried the door open. Abigail ran into the master bedroom just as the men started following her up the stairs. Tanner shut the door behind her and locked it, but the masked men started prying off the door frame. That would be truly terrifying. When you have your baby too. Oh god, my god. Can you imagine? So they all went into the bathroom. Tanner held the door while Abigail held their baby. But it was no use. The men ripped off that door as well. And as soon as they got in, they looked at Tanner and told him, You're going to rob your bank for us today. Tanner was a loan officer at a local bank. He was handcuffed and he and Abigail were both blindfolded. Abigail was still carrying the baby as they were led out of the house into their own car. One of the men drove right to the bank where Tanner worked. They told him that they were keeping his wife and baby to make sure that he followed the plan exactly. They gave him a black bag and told him to load it with cash from the vault. So Tanner did what he was told. As he walked back through the parking lot with $195,000 in cash, he made a split second decision. He wasn't going to hand over the cash until his family was freed. The passenger side door opened and he held out the bag and demanded the release of his wife and son. There was a brief struggle before the kidnappers yanked the bag away from him and then slammed the door shut. 
and the car sped off with his family still inside. It's crazy. There's literally surveillance footage of, I don't know if we'll be able to insert it, but there's footage mm. of this poor guy, like just looking so stressed out in the parking lot, just kind of like wandering <sighs> around, like while his family's being sped off by these two kidnappers. Like so terrifying. I couldn't even imagine how he was feeling in that moment. Mm -hmm. And just like, what are they going to do to my family? Yeah. Now That'd be the horrible. Money and my family just so helpless. Yeah. Thankfully, the kidnappers eventually pulled over and left Abigail and the baby in the car and sped away in a different vehicle. Which it's very clear that they they really planned this out, that they had mm -hmm. an actual spot that they yeah. were going to go to to switch vehicles, which is really smart. That's true. In order to then, you know, escape. Mm -hmm. They told the police they had been held captive by two middle-aged white males. Agent Mick Nocera was alarmed that an infant was involved in the robbery this time. This was definitely an escalation from the Ziegler case. The Knoxville media reported on both the Tennessee kidnappings, but the families weren't viewed as victims by everyone. Some journalists, police officers, and members of the public were suspicious of them, just like with Matt, questioning why the kidnappers would just let them go in the end. So in the middle of an absolute crisis, yeah. you are also being accused of... Mm -hmm you know, setting all this up and committing these crimes when you're in fact the victim. I mean, that's got to be the hardest thing. Seriously, what a shitty situation to be in. And then three months later in Elizabethton, a city in northern Tennessee, Brooke Lyons was trying to get her three-year-old son, Carson, strapped into his car seat. Carson had demanded candy for breakfast, and when his mother told him no, he threw a tantrum and had it calmed down. While Brooke was dealing with Carson in the back seat, she felt movement behind her. And as soon as she turned around, she saw a man with an assault rifle, and then everything just happened so fast from there. There were two masked men in the driveway, and they pushed her into the car with her toddler. They then drove her to the credit union where she worked as a teller for $9 an hour and told her to go inside and put $350,000 cash into this black bag. They told her if anyone called the police, then they'd make sure that there was a shootout with her and her son right in the middle of it. I believe they also pointed the gun right at her son too, which obviously when you see that, that's just like mm -hmm. going to cause any level. mother to just panic. Start. That's so scary. Mm -hmm. So when she went into the bank, she did not keep her cool. Understandably, she was completely hysterical. She started screaming at her coworkers to open the vault and said that her son was being held hostage outside. But Brooke's boss refused to open it. Brooke begged her, saying that two men with guns had Carson. She was so scared. Her boss told her that she couldn't open the vault, though, because her job was on the line here. Brooke pointed at her and said, you just killed us. Her boss called her boyfriend, a police officer, and he called 911. She said a girl came running in that she works with saying that there were two guys that came to her house that night. And they got guns? So, apparently, she said she came in with a bag wanting her to open the vault. Desperate and hysterical, Brooke ran out of the bank. She pulled open the back passenger side door and threw herself over Carson while begging the men not to shoot. In fact, she told them to leave, to get out of there because cops were on their way. They peeled out of the parking lot and eventually pulled over and they left Carson and Brooke in the back seat. And once again, they sped off in a getaway car. After the media reported on this story, people started to take it more seriously. Brooke was a low-level employee, and from the looks of it, she had done everything wrong if she was after the money herself. The FBI was continuing to investigate. Eventually, they discovered that before each heist, a vehicle would be stolen, and then immediately after, the stolen vehicle was found burned. They located all the stolen vehicles except for a dark burgundy SUV that was stolen before Brooke Lyons and her son were even abducted. So then, these guys moved things to North Carolina. I mean, that's what they do is they, you know, do a couple robberies in one state and then they get the hell out of Dodge to move on to another state. Cause well, they don't want the local police to pick up on their strategies. Right. It becomes very hard for, you know, police to deal with crimes that take place in different, you know, go over different state lines because, you know, if they're gone, there's nothing for them to investigate anymore there. Yeah. And, and it's all, hard to work together with other jurisdictions. Right. Sometimes. Which is also why the FBI gets involved because they can look at, you know, everything mm -hmm. as a whole. So before we get into what happens next in North Carolina, we're going to take our last break and we'll be right back. 
Guys, we all know that shopping for new clothes can be needlessly stressful. So why not let Stitch Fix make it easy by doing the work for you? And you can spend your time doing things you love instead, like being with your pets. Stitch Fix offers clothing hand-selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. It's completely different and a fun way to find clothes that you will love to wear. Every piece is chosen for your fit and your life, and it's the easy solution to finding what makes you look and feel your best. You can try on pieces at home before you buy, keep your favorites, and then send back the rest. Plus, it comes with a prepaid envelope, so you just throw the items that you don't want in there, seal it up, and put it in your mailbox. They have free shipping, easy returns, and exchanges. There's no subscription required, which is awesome. You can try Stitch Fix once or set it up for automatic deliveries. You don't have to do the automatic ones if you don't want to. If you just want to check it out, you can do that as well. All you'll pay is a $20 styling fee for each box. But what's so awesome about that is it actually gets credited towards any pieces that you keep. And there are no hidden fees ever. Stitch Fix has styles and clothing to fit any occasion for women, men, and kids. They ship all over the United States and they're available in the UK as well. So get started today at stitchfix.com slash mile higher and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash mile higher for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash mile higher. When I got out of high school, one of the first things that I did was get a credit card because I was told that you need a credit card in order to build up credit. Well, I started taking advantage of that and I started opening up a bunch of different credit cards. And before you knew it, I was in a decent amount of credit card debt. And when you're making, you know, minimum wage, it's very hard to sort of get yourself out of a debt hole. So unfortunately for me, I didn't know about Upstart and I wasn't able to utilize them to actually get myself out of debt. But looking back, I would 100% use Upstart if I could, because Upstart is the fast and easy way to pay off your debt with a personal loan all in line, whether it's paying off credit cards, consolidating high interest debt, or funding personal expenses, over half a million people have used Upstart to get one fixed monthly payment. So instead of having to pay you know, all these different cards down individually, which can take a long time, there's interest in all of them, you can consolidate that debt, so all those cards, and use a personal loan from Upstart in order to basically pay all those credit cards off, and then you've just got one payment to worry about. It really is the most manageable way to pay down high interest debt. What I love about Upstart is the fact that you're more than just your credit score because not everybody has good credit, so it can be hard to get a loan. But unlike other lenders, Upstart considers your income and current employment to find you a smarter rate for your loan, which is really, really cool and helpful. With a five-minute online rate check, you can see your rate upfront for loans between $1,000 to $50,000. And best of all, you can receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Find out how Upstart can lower your monthly payments and help you get out of debt today when you go to upstart.com slash mile higher. That's upstart.com slash mile higher. And don't forget to use our URL to let them know we sent you. Loan amounts will be determined based on your credit income and certain other information provided in your loan application. But seriously, guys, check out upstart.com slash mile higher today. It could really, really help you out. Less than a month before Brooke Lyons was kidnapped, Adam Russo was driving on I-40 in North Carolina. He was an assistant restaurant manager on his way to a job interview. He had borrowed his fiance's red 2005 Ford Focus, a small compact car. And as he drove, he glanced at his rearview mirror and saw multiple police cars following a dark colored SUV. And he assumed someone was getting pulled over. But then a few minutes later, the SUV hadn't stopped. And he realized that something else more serious was going on. The driver of the SUV then slammed into a car and then he sped up to Adam in the right-hand lane. It was right on his tail, and the driver then rammed his car as if they were trying to run him off the road. But it didn't work, and Adam kept control of the small car and kept watching his rearview mirror. The SUV did the same thing to another car, but this time the car that was hit spun out of control and slammed into the barrier. The SUV also spun out as a result of this, and two men jumped out carrying black bags, and that's when they just took off across the median into oncoming traffic on the interstate and then disappeared into the wooded area along the road. The state troopers that were following this vehicle decided not to pursue them until backup arrived because they now had a wreck on a major interstate and these guys had just took off into the woods. So it wouldn't be a safe situation. Adam was shook up, but okay. And he called his fiance and told her what had happened. And she said it sounded like something out of a movie. Later, she called her father, Brian O'Hare, and told him the story. 
Brian happened to be a special agent in the FBI, and a few details in his daughter's story really stuck out to him. The way she described the driver ramming Adam from behind is a police tactic called a pit maneuver, or pursuit intervention technique. Police officers use it during high-speed chases to get the fleeing car to turn sideways, and once the driver loses control, they stop the car, and the suspect can be apprehended. But if the fleeing car uses this technique, it causes confusion and chaos, allowing them to get away. Because clearly they were just trying to cause a wreck so that it would stop the police officers that were chasing them. Brian also wanted to know what was so important in those black bags that they had to flee with them. Why didn't they just jump out and take off with nothing and run even faster? And why would they risk their lives to cross oncoming traffic on the interstate? The police had launched a search effort after the men fled, but they were never found. And about a month after hearing this story, Brian was actually assigned to Brookline's case. And right away, he had a gut feeling that these cases were connected. And it's absolutely crazy that by happenstance, this guy heard about the story and then got assigned to the case and he was able to put two and two together. And this is what ultimately leads to figuring out who these crazy guys are. Yeah, I was honestly really lucky. It is really lucky. It's, it's wild because up until this point, they have you know mm -hmm. they're they're looking at this as a completely separate incident, mm -hmm. and nobody's really connect all the dots together. In October 2015, Brian shared his hunch with Jeff Blanton, another special agent for the FBI, and they knew they were dealing with dangerous individuals who showed no signs of stopping. With no other leads, they decided to follow up on their hunch. The North Carolina case had started when officers tried to pull over the stolen SUV. And Brian and Jeff watched the dash cam footage from the trooper's car. The suspects were two white males, one tall and one athletic, and the other shorter and stockier. The black bags also matched the descriptions of those in the Ziegler case and the Harris case. Inside the SUV, the FBI decided to take a look at the GPS device in the vehicle. And that's when they discovered several saved routes. And when they looked at the routes, they discovered that one was a location of a credit union near Knoxville. And it looked like the men were looking for the best escape route. Another route led to Maggie Valley, a tourist destination in North Carolina's Great Smoky Mountains. So they contacted the property manager, Melissa Pless, and she told them the location was in Maggie Valley Country Club Estates at a rental called a Southern Comfort. Five months earlier, she said she was contacted by an author named Ron Bradford. And he was looking for a secluded place to write with his assistant. He also insisted that the home have a garage. She then showed him a southern comfort and he said it was perfect. And she then said that he had been staying there ever since paying in cash on a month to month basis. Melissa told the agents that the men were also very respectful and kind and that they even brought her a potted plant and a thank you card. She confirmed that Ron at one point had driven a black Lexus SUV when they first arrived, but she hadn't actually seen it for a few months. So Jeff started searching for Ron Bradford, the author, but no such person existed. And that's kind of when they realized these were the guys. Clearly this is fake name, and then the SUV was a real telltale sign. Jeff and Brian assigned a team to watch the house, and it was under nonstop surveillance, tracking their every move. They observed two white males, one slender and one stocky, coming and going from the house. There was also no white female and no black male. Two weeks after the stakeout started, the day before Thanksgiving, the men left the house in a silver Nissan Pathfinder with stolen Maryland license plates. The police officers were then given the go-ahead to stop them. But of course it wasn't that easy. As soon as they realized what was happening, the Nissan took off for another high-speed chase. So they're being chased down the highway and suddenly it slowed down and came to a stop and the man in the passenger seat is pushed out of the car, still holding a black bag. The officers then immediately moved in and detained him while the other suspect took off. The man claimed that he was just hitchhiking and that he had no idea who the guy was or what was going on. But obviously at this point, the police are not exactly buying it and they go ahead and arrest him and take him to the station. Meanwhile, other officers are continuing the chase after the guy in the Nissan. And at some point, the driver of the Nissan cut off a guy in a red pickup truck, which this really pissed off the guy in the pickup truck. And he actually joined the chase 
and quickly overtook the police. That's awesome. Yeah. So now this guy, this random guy in a pickup truck is now chasing after the Nissan Pathfinder with the police cars behind him. Imagine seeing this. Yeah, it's just wild. It's literally like out of a movie. The Nissan then swerved to an exit ramp and left the interstate, driving into a construction site and right into a ditch. The vehicle came to a stop and the man jumped out and tried to run, but the pickup truck was right behind him the whole time. The truck driver then literally ran him over and pinned this guy under the rear wheel. At that point, the police arrived and got him free. He had a broken collarbone, some broken ribs, and several burns, but he was still, you know, okay enough to be arrested. And they took him to the station where his friend was already waiting. And it didn't take long for them to identify, in fact, who these men really were. Their names were Brian Witham and Michael Benanti. Brian was a driver, and his criminal record started in his early 20s, and he had multiple armed robbery convictions. He refused to answer any questions at first, saying he was no rat. Michael was a passenger who claimed he was just getting a ride, and he told the police the other guy, Brian Witham, was setting him up. When he was questioned, he went on and on about how this was all a mistake and that he should have never been arrested and he didn't do anything wrong. Because Michael was bragging about how he was this big time, high level executive CEO, and he said that this arrest would destroy his business and his reputation. And it turns out that Michael was an executive. He had founded a company called Prison Assistant. He would help manage the finances of inmates while they were in prison and then help them stay clean when they got out. The company was a success. It was actually featured in the Wall Street Journal in 2014, and Michael even tried to get it on Shark Tank. He made like a little audition tape, but that didn't work out so well. It turns out that Michael had multiple felony convictions, including attempted murder of a police officer, robbery, theft of property, and a federal conviction of conspiracy to commit bank robbery. When he was 19 years old, he and a few friends attempted to rob a bank and a grocery store. Family members insist they were just trying to help their family. His father had just died and his mother was about to lose their home. And they had a bunch of unpaid medical bills to deal with as well. During the grocery store robbery, a police officer was shot. And afterwards, Michael burned the getaway car. Sounds familiar. He was arrested, but then refused to give up his friends. He was sentenced to over 17 years in prison. His motive for the recent bank robberies after getting out of prison was to pay back the money that he had stolen from his own clients. Brian and Michael had met back in 1994 when they were both in prison in Pennsylvania. They had come up with an escape plan together that ultimately failed. And instead, they were both sent to a supermax prison in Colorado to finish their sentences. Michael was paroled in 2008. After he started up his company, Prison Assistant, Brian became one of Michael's first clients. He even counseled him until he was released in 2013 and then gave him a job at his company. Here's a call between the two of them in prison. Brian, take a deep breath. Coming out here is nothing what you think it is. It must be all good, right? I mean... The money. Yeah. Always the money. Yeah. You know, you have to spend more money to make more money. I love yeah. you, Paul. Keep in touch. Special Agent Jeff Blanton arrived to interrogate Michael. He later said that Michael was arrogant. He believed he was the smartest person in any room he was in, total narcissist, and he was totally proud of having served time in a supermax prison. When Michael was arrested, he was holding a piece of paper tightly in the palm of his hand. Officers had to pry his fingers open to get it. And on the paper, someone had written three names down for three bank executives, along with their titles and location of their banks. These were their future targets. The assistant U.S. attorney called away from his vacation after the Ziegler case and got a team of FBI agents together and a search warrant for the rental home in Maggie Valley. And then they spent all of Thanksgiving Day and Black Friday 2015 going through the house, and there was a lot of evidence to process. Inside, they found electronic devices, cameras, fake police badges, weapons, and a staggering amount of photos. They enlarged one photo and got a clear image of Michael in a rearview mirror. But Michael, who they suspected was the mastermind behind everything, still refused to talk. So they put Michael and Brian in adjoining cells to see if they would talk to each other. But instead of talking, Michael attempted suicide. He whispered to Brian to blame everything on him and then used a razor to slit his wrists and throat. He was rushed to the hospital and was in critical condition. Thinking Michael was dying, Brian told the investigators everything. He explained that before each kidnapping and robbery, 
they had spent months researching potential targets. First, they would research a bank and gather all the information they could on the employees. Then they stalked them online, watched their social media accounts carefully, and tracked them. The more information a person posted online, the more likely they would be targeted. And it turns out they had actually postponed the attack on Tanner and Abigail Harris after seeing a Facebook update that their baby was born. They had also learned through Facebook that the Ziegler family had an adult daughter in Texas. After selecting the next victim, Brian would stake out their home. He would hide in their yard or in a tree, wearing head-to-toe camouflage clothing for hours and hours just sitting there. He even planted cameras around people's homes. He took meticulous notes on everything that happened in the house, noting when someone came or left, when the lights were turned off or on, what time they ate their meals, when they went to bed. Then they would compile all of this data into sophisticated information packets, and investigators found dozens of these packets in a black briefcase inside the rental house. It turns out they were stalking future victims. They had information on people in South Carolina and Georgia, along with packets of information on previous victims. There were literally thousands of photographs of houses, neighborhoods, banks, streets, people, and anything else they thought might be useful. The division SWAT team leader examined these packets and said that they were the quality that he would use for a hit. Before their stakeouts, Brian would shave his entire body, and he brought a jug to use as a bathroom to avoid leaving behind any DNA. They were careful not to leave any trace of physical evidence. There was still the question of other suspects, though. A black male, a white woman a white male with a sunburst tattoo. But it turns out all of those people were Michael and Brian. Inside the house, they had multiple fake tattoos, two masks to help them change their race and gender. They had wigs. And these weren't Halloween costume masks and wigs. Each one cost about 1500 bucks. They were purposely confusing the victims and police by altering their identities, which is pretty smart. And according to Brian, there were more victims. They had been doing this up and down the East Coast since summer of 2014. Investigators actually checked out a case in a small Pennsylvania town from 2014. Two masked men, one slender, one heavier, had robbed a bank at gunpoint and left with $156,000. And every detail matched exactly as Brian said it would. Meanwhile, Matt Yesman had recently appeared before a grand jury in Connecticut, and he was about to be indicted. But on December 1st, his boss told him FBI agents were coming to his office to meet with him. And Matt assumed he was going to be arrested in front of his employees for, you know, the bank robbery. But instead, they arrived and told him he was no longer a suspect and that they had arrested the men who kidnapped him in North Carolina. What a relief. Yeah, seriously. I mean, he literally broke down and cried after hearing this news. I would too. Because it had been nine months that he'd been yeah. dealing with this and everybody thinking he was involved. Insane. What mental torture. Matt was very relieved but angry at how he and his mother had been treated after such a traumatizing ordeal. And I think it's important you hear, you know, how he felt. Being held at gunpoint, seeing my mother held at gunpoint, going through all that trauma was just, you know, intense. But it was over in 12 hours. For the next nine months, I was considered a suspect. I was you know, dragged in front of a grand jury. Um, it, you know, the FBI was after me. The police were after me. Everybody was convinced I was guilty. And then, you know, like I said, nine months later, I think it was December 1st, when the FBI came to my office and told me the news that they'd caught two people down in North Carolina. And I think his exact words were, there's overwhelming evidence connecting them to you. And I looked at the guy and said, what does that mean? And he goes, there's overwhelming evidence connecting them to you. And I'm like, does that mean I'm exonerated? And he looked at me and he said, yes. He goes, you are completely exonerated. And that was the biggest weight you could ever imagine. He also blamed himself for not noticing that he and his mother were being watched for all that time. He thought he should have paid more attention and he could have stopped this from happening to other people. Because literally the FBI was just doing surveillance on him the entire nine months that this was all going on. But Michael Benanti didn't die from a suicide attempt, as Brian had thought. He actually recovered and stood trial. In 2017, he was convicted on 23 counts, including armed bank extortion and kidnapping, and he was sentenced to four consecutive life sentences, plus 155 years. And to this day, Michael maintains his innocence, of course. Mm. What I can tell you is, 
there is no link to me to anything. <laughs> there's no DNA I mean, like this, that's on the scene that proves that I was in, in the house. There's no fingerprints, there's no witnesses, there's no nothing. I'll tell you flat out <laughs> that I did not participate in those Tennessee robberies. I told Brian, I said, you know what, I'm going to just end it. And I just ripped my neck open. Mm. And I ripped my arm open. Mm. I didn't expect that live. So surely he didn't expect that live. It's a picture of a, of a, a bank in a McDonald's or corner of a, a, you know, to say that I robbed the Tennessee banks, or, and that's proof of it, is, is, is incorrect. He's also suspected of murdering his girlfriend, Natasha Bagove, who helped him run his company, Prison Assistant. Her body was actually found in a hotel in Pennsylvania in October 2015. Michael claims he found a suicide note and said she was depressed. Mm. And then no autopsy was done and he had her body cremated very yeah. quickly after. Sounds like he was involved in that. Brian Witham was given a much lighter sentence of 30 years. Investigators who worked on this case believe the lesson to be learned here is for people to be more careful about what they post online. I think that's such a good point because I don't think you think that this will ever happen to you, but sometimes you can post things even with things in the background or your house in the background that can be really revealing. And it's hard in our culture today where people are sharing everything. You know, you have yeah. People on YouTube doing full house tours and showing the outside of their house, and I don't think they realize how dangerous that is. That's or why we stop doing that kind of content. I think how you were saying a lot of people are thinking like, "Oh, well, it's not going to happen to me." Like right. the chances of that are so small, which is yeah. true. But, but there's always still, a chance. Right. You want to be careful because these people, I'm sure, really regretted posting some of the things that they did online, and it sucks that some people have to learn this way. I mean, this is the worst possible right case scenario that could happen right but yeah i mean in a in a perfect world though i mean this this doesn't happen you know i think right. i mean the chances of having somebody home invade you is very very slim so i mm -hmm. think most of us kind of put it out of sight out of mind but i think in this especially if you are a bank employee yeah i think it's you even have to be more careful yes if you have you know if you are in a position where a criminal might utilize you in order to commit a crime if you work at a bank at all i mean one of these right. girls was a bank teller right right Could have been you and some of these yeah, god <laughs> i know and I, i'm just thinking about like when i would leave the bank because sometimes i'd like close the bank down and stuff mm -hmm. and and i would shut it down it would be like two of us and they have like certain there's certain protocols for like how you leave and usually there's like you're not walking out the front door usually mm -hmm. there's like a kind of a secret employee side door that you go out of uh -huh. because that you all and, and they do tell you they're like you know always check the parking lot and before you go out because mm. you know a lot of times you know that's like the perfect time to rob a bank is at the end of the day when you know well actually it's not because once you close the vault there's no getting the vault you know getting the vault back yeah. open is a is a chore mm -hmm. i mean it's not it's not that easy it's not like you just walk mm -hmm. in and enter in a code and the huge vault opens it's actually very yeah. very complex and it requires multiple people to do it so i i think you know that's why a lot of bank robberies occurred during the middle of the day is because the vault door is usually wide open because they keep it open during the day to access it yeah much easier but yeah you have to be really careful i mean it's mm -hmm. i mean it's definitely something that i i don't think i really ever really considered as much but then again i was in a small farming town where the chances of that happening are very slim but in larger banks where you know they hold more money and things like mm -hmm. that that you do have to be careful yeah and i think they should be paying some type of hazard pay on top of salaries you for would that. think you would think but no they're greedy no nope, they're they fucking don't. banks yeah <laughs> they don't they don't give you anything extra for putting your life at risk dealing with yeah with uh you know the public and Scary. stuff and possible bank robberies yeah, i mean there's panic buttons what stuff, your experience but. has been like if you work in a bank or if you've had any run-ins or just weird things happen but this is like the worst of the worst mm -hmm. you know case scenarios that could play out where yeah. they're literally hunting and stalking you at your home yeah, and to be so violated scary. like that is the worst because everybody mm -hmm. associates their house with being their safe place right mm -hmm. you assume you're safe at home you can keep your baby safe at home your wife whatever and yeah to know that these guys were literally in the tree mm -hmm. oh, watching you had gopro cameras totally everywhere scary. like recording your every move mm -hmm. when you went to bed Ooh. watching you through the windows that that's like some of the creepiest mm -hmm. things that could happen to you i feel like mm -hmm. yeah we all got to be vigilant in today's day and age. That's the There's lesson. a lot of creeps out there. It's a lesson with true crime really is like yeah. you have to just be aware and, you mm -hmm. know, aware of your surroundings and check your trees before <laughs> oh you go God. to bed. Oh my God, check your trees. <laughs> check your trees <laughs> and bushes. Oh my God, stop.
you never know, man. I mean, better be safe than sorry, right? Be vigilant. That's all I got to say. Be vigilant. <laughs> neighborhood watch, okay? <laughs> yes, form your own neighborhood watch. <laughs> <laughs> we need a neighborhood watch. We keep having some dudes stealing mail from us. Oh, really? Yeah, well, they keep stealing. Like, how does the neighborhood watch stop multiple that? Multiple <laughs> credit cards for me. I had to cancel. Oh, shit. that's like a big thing. That that's why you got to get a locked up mailbox these days. Yeah, mm -hmm. we need a neighborhood watch. We can run it. It's crimes everywhere, man. There's people committing crimes everywhere all the time. Know. But we'll go ahead and wrap up today's episode there. Hopefully, you found this one interesting. It's a it's a wild one for mm -hmm. sure. But let us know in the comments, you know, if you've worked in a bank, have you ever been robbed? What's your experience uh, with that? Because it yeah. happens more often than you think. Oh, I'm sure it does. Not like this usually, but, you know, bank robberies do happen quite a bit. So mm -hmm. interested to hear your thoughts. But yeah, we'll be back next week with another episode of the Mile yeah, High Podcast. We will. But until then, keep taking your mind a mile higher. higher.